Okay, uh, uh, we're just going to continue working through our test review. So um, we did pages one and two yesterday, and today we're going to do pages three and four. Again, uh, the keys are all in the packet, so if you're working ahead, um, you, can, uh, you can look at the solutions and see how you're doing. A uh, couple of things I want to point out. Uh, the packet that you just picked up, um, I want you guys to have it because uh, I'm going to be picking out from those problems for my help sessions. So uh, either uh, yeah, just additional resources if you want to sit in on those help sessions or you want to work through the problems on your own. Um, so uh, I've been, I, I started with a, a help session this morning uh, and I'll be setting out the team's link on a daily basis. Um, I'll have been recording. I'll, I recorded this uh, the mornings and uh, one from the morning, and I put it on the website. It's all under uh, the dates on my website, so you should be able to find those easily. Um, just to let you know, though, that uh, these are these aren't. Um, I don't have some of the pages are just the keys, so I'm just picking. I'll be picking out those problems to work through. But um, you probably, if you're working through on your own, you may need to. Um, work on a separate sheet uh, just to work out the problems and then, and then use the key to, um, to prepare your answers. Okay. Um, but, uh, but if we have time, uh, we can always uh, pick out those problems in class as well to, to work through. Um, okay, oh, uh, I, do have a, I, I do have to backtrack on something that I said that I was going to give you on the test. So I, I was talking to Mr. Jones and uh, I think we both agree that um, that it's important for us to know how to get to the unit circle without being provided the blank unit circle. So on the test, uh, I'm not be providing you a blank unit circle. You do need to be able to create that on your own because on the AP exam, they're not going to give you a blank unit circle. So you need to be able to, to build that. Okay, so uh, we do need to be able to build our unit circle on our own if we need those um, those trig values. Okay, so. I want to give you a heads up on that before um, before test day. OK, so uh, let's go to page three. Um, I want to talk about how uh, we can uh, solve for X without having to rely on double angle or um, trig identities. Um, and just just uh, finding multiple solutions just based off of inverse trig. So that's what we're going to do here with the first step. We're going to um, just get that 2x by itself, move that cosine. And when you move that cosine, what you're doing is you're involving inverse in order to move it over to the side. So um, I'm going to just isolate 2x to begin with. Once that cosine moves, it becomes inverse cosine of one. So what does that mean? Well, inverse cosine of one, that represents theta. So that right side represents theta, so or x. I'm going to say theta in terms of degrees here, or um, radian measure. So theta is inverse cosine of one. So what that means is saying, what, what theta value will allow cosine to be equal to one, so that's what that means. Okay, and we're gonna what we're gonna do. We're gonna list out um, the solutions that fits that criteria, and then we'll continue trying to solve for x. So, what will allow what theta or what sorry what x value will allow cosine to be one? Okay, zero. Um, well, zero and two pi. Okay. Now, typically we would just stop there, right? But what's happening is um, even though it looks like we have all, all the solutions between 0 and 2 pi, what's going to happen is we're trying to solve for x. So when we're trying to solve for x, we're going to 
divide by two, when we divide by two, these values are going to shrink. If our values shrink, that means there could be more that we need to involve. So we typically like to uh, go past two pi because ultimately when they shrink, we want to make sure we have all the solutions um, that can fill in that entire zero to two pi range. So if I want to find coterminal angles past two pi, I can just add what? Yeah, just keep adding two pi. Um, I'm going to just do more than I need. And typically, uh, having more than you need is good because that way, if you're eliminating answers, that means you know that you've gone far enough and that you didn't accidentally miss out on some solutions. Okay, so now I want to solve for x to solve for x, uh, divide by two, dividing by two is the same thing as multiplying by one half. So now if I solve for x, 0 over 2 is still 0, 2 pi over 2 is pi. OK, I have more than enough. So the only solution that I can really keep is what? Just pi, right? Because 0 and 2 pi are even that is too far out. Um, so this is kind of overkill right now, but I just uh, want to kind of give you that uh, that heads up that um, anytime you're dividing, you want more than uh, you think you need because they're all going to end up shrinking. Um, and we want the final result to be in that in that interval um, that we're looking for. OK, so uh, we're going to attempt the same strategy here with number number two. Um, so we're going to try to isolate that 4x by itself, bring that tangent over to the other side, involve inverse tangent. So that's another way of saying. The right side is another way of saying what theta or what x value will allow tangent to be one. So where is tangent equal to one? Pi over four. Good. First and third quadrant, right? In that pi over four family. So now we're dividing by four. So what that means is it's really going to shrink down quite a bit. So we want to get a lot of coterminal angles going. Um, so we have to stretch out a lot further. Um, so I want to add what? Add two pi to both of these, right? Because these are in different quadrants here. Um, adding two pi just to make it easier with matching my common denominator here. That's the same thing as what adding a pi over four. That way I can just focus on my numerator and just keep adding that numerator. Okay, so pi over four plus a pi over four. What do I get? Five plus eight. 13. Okay, so the one that I that I just found, I'm going to keep adding 2 pi to it. So the next one up is okay. then I'll do one more here. Sorry, this is 21. The next one is 25. Okay. Hopefully more than enough. Um, I'm going to divide by four, divide by four, same thing as multiplying by one fourth. And we're going to see all these values are going to shrink. So multiply one fourth, that means I'm going to multiply the denominator by four here. So pi over 16. Okay, thankfully, we're only going to go out up to pi. So which ones can we remove? Yeah, so anything above 17, because we know 16 pi over 16 is 1 pi. So anything above 16 pi over 16 is, is out. But it's nice to take to remove um, and solutions outside the interval, because now you know that you didn't accidentally, you didn't actually not go far enough. Any questions so far? Okay, so we're going to use that strategy um, in, in uh, this next problem here. Um, number three says find the critical points for the function in the domain from zero to two pi. Um, I'm going to I'm going to re I'm going to rephrase this problem as a particle motion problem. I think this will be good for what we can, we can expect on the test. So let's say I, I uh, gave a position function as e to the t plus sine of 2t. And I called it the position function. 
And then the direction says, instead of finding a critical point, let me say, uh, find where the particle is at rest. So what's the strategy then? If this is a position function, then by asking for where particle is at rest, what would you do first? Find the velocity, velocity which is the derivative down, and then once you find the velocity, then you do what? You set equal. Good. So that's the strategy there. We set velocity equal to zero. And if I went a little further and I said, um, find uh, intervals where the particle is moving left or moving right, then you would do what after this? You would create a what? Right, velocity sign line, put your critical points there, test your interval, positive interval will be moving right, negative interval will be moving left. Okay, so we're going to practice through that process so you can kind of see uh, a similar uh, problem was going to show up on the test there. Okay, so if I want to find where particles are at rest, I'm going to find velocity to find velocity. I need to find the derivative to find the derivative. Let's think about the rules involved here. This is e to the u, right? What's the what's the rule for e to the u? Good. E, times u. e to the u times u prime. This that's one that you're going to have to know for the test. Okay. All right. So b of t e to the u times u prime. So I'm going to copy the original problem. times u prime. U prime is the derivative of my entire exponent. So t becomes 1 plus sine of 2t becomes cosine. Good. So cosine of u becomes cosine of u times u prime. So it's cosine of 2t times 2. OK, we have our velocity function. Now we're going to set it equal to 0. I'll pull that two out of front. OK, so we have two separate expressions that we can set equal to zero, um, but one of these is not going to give us a solution. Which one is not going to give us a solution? All right, this e to the t plus sine of 2t. OK, if I try to set that equal to zero, I can do natural log and see that's not going to make sense. Also, another thing to keep in mind is uh, kind of have an idea what this graph looks like, right? It's an exponential function. All your exponential functions look like this. And all your exponential functions are all going to hover above the x-axis, which means it'll never touch the x-axis, which means it'll never hit zero. So anytime you see this sort of a, uh, expression, you can go from a natural log perspective, take natural log both sides, convince yourself there's nothing there, or from a visual perspective, understand your exponential function is just not going to touch zero. So we can ignore that. That's not going to give up a solution. Just the 1 plus 2 cosine 2t two equal to 0 is where, what we have to think about. OK, so I'm going to isolate that cosine 2t two two first. So subtract 1, divide by 2. Let's involve inverse cosine, so we don't have to worry about uh, double angle identity. So um, 2t equals inverse cosine of negative 1 half. Okay, so think about your unit circle values here. Um, where is cosine going to be negative? Which quadrants? Second and third, right? In what in what family? Pi over three, right? So we'll list out the pi over three family in the second and third quadrant. You got two pi over three. You have four pi over three. Okay, we're going to divide by two, which means that these are going to shrink. So in order for us to ensure that um, we have enough solutions, we should find coterminal angles by doing what? Add. Add two pi. Two pi to match the denominator is what? Six pi over three. Okay. So I need to add it to both of these because they're in different quadrants, so I need to make sure I um, get those variations going. OK, so uh, 2 pi over 3 plus 6 pi over 3. 4 pi over 3 plus 6 pi over 3. OK, this may be overkill, but I'm going to just add a few more here. So 
ones I just got, I'm going to add. OK, all right, so more than enough. Divide by two, see how they shrink. So. Um, two pi over six. Okay, I want everything from zero to two pi, so are there any ones that are outside my interval? Okay. Which ones? Uh, anything above 12 pi over six, right? Because 12 pi over six is the same thing as two pi, so I can remove the 14 and 16. Okay, we clean those up a little bit here. So T equals pi over three, two pi over three, four pi over three. Five, five, three. Should we list all of them? Yes, we need to because okay. after they shrink, we want everything from zero to two pi. Gotcha. Right. So that's why we want to list out more than two pi because when they shrink, they actually end up filling in that role. Um, we're going to do another problem later where we're going to we're going to go further and and uh, find interval where the particle is moving left or moving right. But as a preview from here, we would create our velocity sign line, put these critical points onto a velocity sign line, choose values to test in each interval. Positive interval would mean moving right, negative inter interval would be moving left. Okay, but we'll um, we'll see another one of these problems on the next page. But every any questions so far? Okay, let's uh, let's look at number four. Um, find the equation of the tangent line to the graph at three negative one for the equation sine of pi x plus cosine of pi y equals x squared y. So I'm I worked it out on a separate sheet of paper so I can have enough room. Okay, so um, let's look at this equation. Look at how this is set up. Ultimately, we're going to find um, Derivative, find the slope, and then point slope form, right? Um, but to get to the slope, we have to get to the derivative. To get to the derivative, we have to make sure we include the processes in, uh, uh, necessary. So look at how this equation is set up, what's involved here if we want to find the derivative. Implicit, right? So anytime you see y mixed into the equation and y is not by itself or y is attached to something else or in something else or multiple y's, you know you got to collect your dy dx's, okay? Good. What else? Product rule, right? That x squared y, we got to do product rule to build out that derivative. OK, so try that. So any time that you're about to take a derivative of anything that has y in it, take its derivative, but then you have to um, immediately include a times dy dx. So here's something that, that is nice to see here. Count how many y's there are. Okay. You have two instances of y's, which means that you should end up with two instances of dy dx once everything, once um, you take your next step. Okay, so sine pi x becomes cosine pi x times pi, good. Okay. Cosine of pi y becomes negative sine pi y times, good. Pi is the coefficient that stays, y becomes one, but y's derivative includes to include dy dx. Good. And then from there, we got to do a product rule on the right side. Okay. F prime g plus fg prime. x squared becomes 2x. y stays. F stays as x squared and the y becomes what? Dy dx. Good. Okay, so now we're just um, trying to push things, push things together a bit. Um, we're going to uh, move things around, right? We want all the, there are four terms that we have there. We want to 
put the two terms that have dy dxs on the left, the non dy dx terms we're going to put on the right. Okay, so these two terms I want on the left side. So I'll subtract the x squared dy dx over. And also I'll move the pi x, pi cosine pi x to the right side. Okay, uh, what can I do next? Left side I can do what? Factor out that dy dx. Okay, factor dy dx, and then you'll create a set of parentheses, and then you'll divide that parentheses over. Okay, so I have the derivative. How can I find my slope? Uh, so we're not trying to figure out where the slope is equal to zero. We just want to find the slope at a point. So yeah, plug in, plug in the x and y values, right? We want to, we have our slope formula. We're trying to get to a slope. So we have the location that we want. So take the order pair at the top of the page. Insert three in for x, insert negative one in for y. And then you're also going to try to clean up your cosine and your sines and try to get it down to as clean as you can um, a, a numeric value. Okay, so that's the notation that we typically use. If we have a derivative that has x and y's, we use that um, vertical line with the three with the order pair to indicate that. Okay, this derivative, I need both the x and y values, so I'm about to insert them into my derivative equation. Okay, what's cosine of 3 pi? Cosine of 3 pi is the same thing as cosine of pi, pi, which is negative, negative 1. Okay, so negative 1 and negative pi will become positive pi. And then uh, sine of negative pi, negative pi is the same as pi, and sine of pi is Zero. Okay, so I was going to wipe this out. Okay, so I end up with negative six plus pi over negative nine, or you can um, change all the signs and make it six minus pi over nine. Either way is fine, but that's your slope. Okay. You have your order pair, which is three negative one, and then point slope form. There's your tangent line equation. But either variation is fine. Okay, number five, we'll do a full related rates problem. Okay, um, with related rates, it's always going to be a right triangle. Okay, uh, so person X and person Y are walking on the street. Straight streets that meet at right angles. Y travels south, approaches the intersection at two meters per second. Person X travels east and moves away from the intersection at one meters per second. So um, find the rate at which the distance Z between person X and Y is changing when Y is 10 meters from the intersection and X is 20 meters from the intersection. So um, the first part is just going to be a straightforward Pythagorean theorem problem. So Y is moving south, X is moving east. 
the Pythagorean theorem, x squared plus y squared equals z squared. Um, find the derivative. Every variable gets its own d over dt. Okay, so we list out all of our six variables in play and uh, see uh, what we can do to um, fill out these values. Okay, so X, Y, Z. EXDT, EYDT, ECBT. Okay, so the problem says um, Y travels south and approaches the intersection at two meters per second. Um, what can we assign that value to? There's movement though. Yeah, DYDT. Any adjustment here? Negative y. Yeah, good. Distance is decreasing. Not because it's moving south. It's the, it's the fact that this length of the triangle is decreasing. So that's why we want that to be a negative. Okay. Person X travels uh, east, moves away from the intersection at one meter per second. What's that one going to go for? The XDT, positive or negative? Positive because. Length is increasing, right? Not because it's moving right. Left and right has, has no bearing. Is the fact that that length of the triangle is increasing. Yeah, so positive. I'm sorry. Um, negative two is for dy dt. Dx dt is positive. Okay. Uh, find the rate at which the distance z is changing. So we're looking for dz dt. That's the unknown. Um, when y is 10 meters from the intersection and x is 20. So y is 10, x is 20. So how can I find z? Okay, Pythagorean theorem. It's not going to be a um, an easy. It's not going to be quite as clean as three, four, five, but we can work this out. So square root of 500. Okay, if you hunt for a perfect square inside of 500, um, we can think about 100, 100 times 5. And roots 100 is just 10, so clean that up to be 10 root 5. So we have everything that we need to find dz dt. So plug in 20 uh, for x. Um, dx dt gets replaced with 1. y gets replaced with 10. dy dt is negative 2. Um, z is 10 root 5. And it's trying to solve for dz dt. Okay, so we get 40 minus 40, which is 0. Divide by 20 root 5, and we get 0. So this is this is not a, a constant value. It's not like a ladder problem, but it just so happens that at this moment in time, it's just a coincidence that DCDT is 0. But if it's any other time, we know that rate is changing, right? Uh, but it just so happens at that moment in time, it's, it's, um, it's at 0. Okay, any questions with part A? Okay, part B, part B says, at what rate is the angle theta changing at that same moment? Now, um, 
Uh, the direction in the problem doesn't really identify where that theta is. So on the test, I'll be very specific. I'll either draw a picture for you or I'll, I will specify where that theta is. So you don't have to guess where that theta is. OK, but I know the, the directions on this problem is not very clear here. But um, OK, let's go ahead and um, figure out how we can solve for theta. Now there is no constant side. So we can choose anything, either sine, cosine, or tangent. Uh, I'm just going to have us go through tangent because that's the way I, I did it, but um, because we have original information from DYDT and DXDT. So, um, but typically, if I see a constant, I'm going to hunt for that constant and use a trig function that has a constant. But here, um, these are all variables, so I'm I'm stuck with having to go through. Um, variables on my right side of my equation. So tangent theta is equal to y over x. OK, we can find the derivative for tangent. Y over x, we have no. Um, uh, we have no option but to use what? For the derivative. Yeah, we got to go through quotient rule, right? So typically, if there's a constant, we can avoid it by just doing power rule. But if we have variables, if if all three sides are changing, we can't avoid Ocean rule. OK, so let's go ahead and find the derivative. Tangent becomes secant squared theta, remember, um, d over dt for every variable. Okay. f prime g minus fg prime all over g squared. So now let's go back and uh, look at what we've gathered from part A. Do we have everything on this side of the equation? Yes, we have everything that we need. We're looking for d theta dt. OK. What's the last piece of information that we still need to look for? Good. Secant square theta. Um, again, I see students getting caught on this problem. They're trying to figure out what theta is. We don't care and we, we're not going to worry about theta. We want this entire secant theta to be replaced. We were looking for the ratio, OK? So um, let me go to my triangle. Um, I like to create a second triangle. I think some students just use the triangle that they already have, which is fine, but I just like to look at it with triangle with just numbers fill out, filled out for all the sides. So at this moment in time, I know my y is 10. I know my x is 20. I know my hypotenuse is 10 root 5. So let's figure out what is secant of theta so we can make a replacement there. What's secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So secant is what? Hypotenuse over adjacent. Yeah. Let me just clean this up so it just feels so I can have smaller numbers to work with. What can I reduce that 10 root 5 over 20 down to? Yeah, 1 over 2 or just root 5 over 2. OK, so I'm going to start filling everything in. Um, you won't have a calculator on the test, so as long as you can get d theta dt by itself, and if you if you don't clean up your expression on the right, I'm OK with that. OK, um, but as long as everything is in this right place, uh, the numbers are right, I won't take off points if you don't reduce. So secant is root 5 over 2. I'm going to make sure I square that. Okay, so dy dt I'll replace with negative 2. x I'll replace with 20. y I'll replace with 10. dx dt I'll replace with 1. And then x squared I can replace with 20 squared. What can I do with that root 5 over 2? Make it to 5 over 4, and then I have to move it. So 5 fourths is going to turn into what? 4 fifths, right? Dividing by a fraction is the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So I get negative 40 minus 10, which is negative 50. So I get negative 50 over 20 squared times 4 fifths. 
if you leave our answer like this, I'm OK with that. But if you can clean up, it'll go all the way down to negative one tenths units of measure. Remember, radi um, theta is always radians. We're not dealing with degrees here, so it's always radians per time unit. The time unit is seconds, so radians per second. And your related rates problem on the test will look a lot like this one. So if you feel good about this, you should. You should be able to get that down for the test. OK, this is an important one. Any questions? Any questions about the steps? And going back to tangent theta equals y over x, we could have done this problem with sine or cosine because we have more information than we need all right so here we're not restricted to just tangent we could have done sine we could have used cosine because we have all, we have all the values for all the variables and all the derivative values as well so i just decided to use tangent just for practice purposes everybody good all right let's look at number six we'll do a full curve sketch problem So number six says, sketch the graph of a function x minus sine x on the interval from zero to four pi. Find all order pairs of relative extrema, absolute extrema, and POI. So we can go directly into finding the derivative, right? Set the derivative equal to zero, find our critical points, plot our sine, our velocity, sorry, um, at derivative sine line. So x minus sine x becomes. Mm -hmm. Minus. One minus cosine x. And we set that equal to. Zero. So for cosine. Or is cosine equal to one? Zero, two pi, and four pi. I just did that because I see the uh, my my boundary there, but really just um, zero and but just two pi. That's going to sit between my endpoints. Really. So here's my sign line. What's the easy value for me to choose? Pi and three pi. I'm going to test this against my derivative function, right? So cosine of pi is negative one, one minus negative one. One plus one, right? It's two, so. I know that interval my graph is increasing. Right, plug three pi in, cosine of three pi is also negative one. One minus negative one is positive. Okay, so um, typically the graph I give you will be rising and falling, but in this case, this graph is is both rising. So there's no relative max or relative min. The graph just increases, it flattens for a moment, but it continues increasing. All right, finding the second derivative function. We'll continue on from f prime. Okay, one becomes zero. Cosine of x becomes right. So negative sine of x, but the two negatives cancel out, so just sine of x. Okay, so we set sine of x equal to zero. Where's sine equal to zero? Zero pi, two pi, three pi. So we're going to keep going until we hit four pi. Okay, so we place all of that onto our second derivative sine line.
I'll choose values in each sub interval. I'll choose one half pi, 1.5 pi, 2.5 pi, 3.5 pi. Okay, into this into the second derivative, sine of pi over two is positive, so concave up. Sine of three pi over two is negative one, concave now. Five pi over two is same thing as pi over two, right? If I subtract two pi, I get pi over two. So sine of five pi over two is also positive. If you don't recognize 7 pi over 2, you can subtract 2 pi from it. 7 pi over 2 is the same thing as 3 pi over 2, so negative. Okay, so what can we conclude from the second derivative sign line? 3 PLIs, yeah, 3 PLIs. Okay, so um, to sketch the graph, we can just um, plug in the endpoints, um, plug in the critical points back into the what? Original function, right? And these original functions are easy to plug in. Um, in fact, that sine of x will just go to zero because sine of zero pi, two pi, three pi, four pi are all zero. So I listed out all my order pairs, right? All the important values, the endpoints, the critical points, the um, from the first and second derivative function. So my endpoints are at 0, 0, and 4 pi, 4 pi. So I'm just going to create a graph uh, with those as my um, tick marks. So my first order pair is at 0, 0. I also have 4 pi, 4 pi. From my uh, derivative sign line, I'm going to also do 2 pi as well. So 2 pi, 2 pi. So it looks like these points are all along a line here. Now, looking at my slope sign line, I know my graph is just always increasing, right? It flattens out for a moment, but it's just going to be increasing. So I know that's the general path of the, of the graph. I didn't, I'm not really paying attention to the curvature. I uh, just want to get um, that slope matched up with my slope sign line. And now I can just worry about my concavity, right? So between all the points, I can just connect the dots with the appropriate curvature. So from zero to pi, I'll make the graph concave up. From pi to 2 pi, switches to concave down. 2 pi to 3 pi, concave up. 3 pi to 4 pi, concave down. And the problem is also asking for absolute max and absolute min, so we can tell by looking at the graph, right? What's the absolute max height? 4 pi. The lowest y value is 0, so that's the absolute min. Okay. So after you, have your, after you have your graph filled out, then find the highest and lowest points, and that's your absolute max, and that's your, and your absolute min. And go ahead and practice filling out the rest of the information that's asked of you. And that's easy. You just pull all that from your concavity and slope sign line. Points of inflection, um, concavity, intervals. Okay, any questions? Okay, good. Um, 
Uh, I'll have a, a help session tomorrow, 730. I'll continue to pick problems out from the test of their help session packet. All right, don't get your phones. Do you have anything on your um, the website that's like um, looking for places on the unit circle? Like the coordinates? Because sometimes I still get confused on um, how to find the like, slices. Uh, the other one, the ones that are the same. Oh, you mean like like seeking? Yeah. Okay. And then you're gone. <laughs> you go through a rope. You mean, you mean if you have the inner circle in front of you, you're not sure how to find? Right. Okay. I, I'm just not very fast at that, and I want to get better at it. Okay. Let me let me help you in a second. Okay. Uh, why do you use the only the square, the, the not the square, the triangle with only the the, the the letters? Like why is it an X? Like why can't you use the triangle with the numbers already on it? Like these numbers already. Um, because because if I'm if I'm building my um my derivative, I have to let the variable say if if it's if it's changing within the variable. Right. There's no constant in this problem because your Y is moving, your X is moving, every part of the triangle is it is staying, it's moving. So we can't have we can't have that number come up until the derivative shows up. Now if it was a problem where it was a, like a ladder problem where that ladder is staying constant the whole way through, then then I can use that 13 or 25 and take my yeah. But but if your parts if all three parts are moving. You're forced to have to use all variables. They're not going to be in that. Numbers. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So it makes sense. It's just not something I can like over the top of my head. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. 